questions. Welcome to the fourth session of the Global Experts Finger Series. My name is Suzanne. Today we are extremely fortunate to have two global speakers with us, Mr. David Estrin and Ms. Dominique Soris. The speaker is mainly about climate change, but also about human rights and the law and how those are intertwined. David Estrin is a technologist, Canada Senior Environment and Law Specialist, and one of the best lawyers in Canada. He has practiced for, for 40 years of consistency in this area. Currently, Mr. Estrin is a Senior Research Fellow with the International Law Research Program at the Center for International Governance and Innovation, a think tank based in Waterloo, Ontario. At CIGI, his focus is on legal and institutional remedies for limiting greenhouse gas emissions and on innovative approaches to address climate change loss and damage. Mr. S. co chaired the Presidential Task Force on Climate Change Justice and Human Rights. He is now co chair of a working group drafting a model climate change legal remedies statute. Mr. Stern is also an adjunct professor at. York University's Osgood Hall Law School, where he co-founded and co-leads the Environmental Justice and Sustainability Law Clinic. Listen carefully to what Mr. Estrin tells you. He is knowledgeable and wise, with experiences at, at all levels of court and insights from all over the world. He once was the president for the United Nations Club at his high school. This may be the reason for agreeing to speak to us today. He, rem he remembers what it was like to want to know everything about the world. We are also very lucky to have Dominique Cerise. She is a passionate self-starter who is in the final year of her Bachelor of Environmental Studies at the University of Waterloo. Dominique has been recognized as one of Canada's top 30 under 30 sustainability leaders and is as an avid on-campus community organizer. Dominique has worked on climate change and energy policy issues at such places as Environment Canada, the Ontario Energy Board, and the United Nations Environment Program, among many more. Dominique attended the 21st United Nations Conference on Climate Change in Paris, France, as an accredited member of the Seychelles Island negotiating team. While there, she also supported the University of Waterloo Climate Students and the Youth Arctic Coalition. Today we have inspired students from Alpha Secondary School. For our special guest information, Burnaby has eight secondary schools. Our school enrolls approximately a thousand students. Please join us in a warm welcome for our special guests, David Estrin and Miss Dominique Story. Suzanne, thank, thank you very much, uh, it's, uh, and good morning to all of you. It's, uh, Dominique and I are quite excited to be with you today, and I want to thank uh, uh, Ms. Moore and Mr. Lee for inviting us to participate in your global learning program. You know, I think it's a very impressive program, and uh, I think you are very lucky as students to have such insightful teachers in a school board that's uh, helping out to make the facilities available for this to occur. As uh, Suzanne mentioned, uh, I, when back in my high school days, I was quite interested in the UN and global affairs, and so it was kind of a unique thing for me to be asked to uh, speak to you today. It's also important uh, that this is the 70th anniversary of the UN. Uh, back in my day, it wasn't that old. That was back uh, like in ancient history, but it was probably only about 15 years old at that time. And of course, the UN is continuing in the critical areas of climate change and human rights to take a leading role. I'm also pleased to help you because I think it's important that students learn as much as they can about what they can do to affect uh, change in our community where change is needed and in particular with regard to climate change, it's a wicked problem and uh, we need as much help as we can get. I'm also really pleased that Dominique Tours has joined with me today. I met her just a few months ago in Paris in December, but I was quite blown away by her deep interest and energetic involvement in this area. I thought she would be a leading example of what students can do to make a major role and make a major difference in this area, so I'm very glad she's with us. Dominique, over to you. 
Great. So let's start off with a little bit of history. The UN's role in the context of climate change is embodied in the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC. So that took effect in 1994. And since then, actually since 1995, which was the first conference of the parties, there have been 195 countries that meet on an annual basis. So the last conference was COP21, the 21st meeting, uh, in December, which we both attended. So very briefly, I want to talk about a little bit of the objectives of the UNFCCC. So the first is that it sets a lofty but specific goal to stabilize greenhouse gas concentrations at a level that would prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system. It puts the responsibility on developed countries to lead the way in the fight against climate change, and above all, it also directs new funds to climate change activities in developing countries. The next slide illustrates something that I want you to uh, appreciate. Basically, the UN uh, Climate Change Convention works by consensus and it tries to decide what all countries should do together as a common goal. But it doesn't leave it at just a common goal and common efforts. Rather, there is specific state responsibility. As you see in that, uh, that slide, responsibility to ensure that activities within their jurisdiction or control do not cause damage to the environment of other states is a responsibility of each state. Unfortunately, unfortunately, states have largely ignored this clear individual state responsibility. Indeed, some states, when they've been sued recently by their own citizens to reduce carbon emissions, have made the defense that, well, if other states are not reducing their emissions, why should we? Well, that sounds to me like the excuse that oil companies often make when they're uh, told they should be doing more about climate change. When you tell them they should reduce carbon emissions, they flip it around and say, well, it's everyone's responsibility. You're, you drive a car, your family drives a car, so why should we have to do anything? And if you take it in that way, then no one has any responsibility. Fortunately, the courts have recently said that individual states do have a duty to reduce their emissions, regardless of whether others are going to do it. And I'll talk more about that later as to how students and citizens can help in making sure that that attitude is taken further. So simply put, we're currently on a path to environmental and human rights disasters. The Science-Based Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or the IPCC, um, has identified that the dangerous level of warming is two degrees. However, many vulnerable countries, like the small island states, like the Seychelles that I was helping in Paris, call to keep warming no more than 1.5 degrees. For many of them, two degrees would result in sea level rise that would devastate their countries. So what's scary to realize is that we're already at 0.8 degree increase. So if we're going to take a quick look back and understand the key events that brought us to where we are now. So first off, it's, ta it's taken over 20 years of negotiations since the UNFCCC took effect. It's 20 years. You can understand that the complexities of 195 countries coming together and trying to come up with a consensus. Uh, so if you may remember, you may have heard of the Kyoto, Kyoto Protocol, which set internationally binding targets on emission reductions. The problem was it put a heavier responsibility on developed countries to do more of the work, which is why, one of the reasons why it failed, and one of the reasons why Canada was actually the first country to withdraw from the protocol. Years later, in, at COP15 in 2009, the world was hopeful that there would be a new binding agreement that would be signed. And Unfortunately, what came out of it, the Copenhagen Accord, was a non-binding agreement that many look back and think of as a, as a failure that undermined years of negotiations. However, more positively, two years later after that, COP17 in Durban, uh, that's when all the countries agreed that by 2015, there would be a universally legal agreement on climate change, which is why uh, in Paris in December, we finally got to that point. So since, since the, the negotiations began, emissions have been increasing. Right now, the IPCC projects that our business as usual, so not doing anything different, would result in temperature increases of 3.7 to 4.8 degrees above pre-industrial levels. That's hugely different than the 2 degrees or 1.5 degree target that we're trying to, to hope for. So a 3.7 to 4.8 degree world would look like would be devastating. It would look like inundation of coastal cities, increasing risks for food production, unprecedented heat waves in many regions, especially in the tropics. Simply a world we can't accept. All right, so now I'm going to try and relate the 
potential uh, trajectory we're on to this awful temperature increase to human rights and why it's imperative that we do something about it. Climate change hurts innocent people. It puts ordinary people who for the most part have not contributed in any way to global warming at extraordinary risk. When it comes to human suffering, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, doesn't mince its words. It says, climate change is on its way to causing severe, pervasive, and irreversible damage on the world's people, cultures, ecosystems, and economies. Climate change will cause injury and death due to more intense heat waves and fires, floods and droughts, and a rise in foodborne and waterborne diseases. Well, just think about the Zika virus that's now spreading up from the United States and South America. That is due to climate change. The risk is not just a matter of extreme weather events. It's also the intensifying effect climate change has on other intractable problems such as war, famine, economic migration. Think about Syria for a moment and the refugees coming out of that country. Repeated hot summers contributed to a spike in droughts across Syria, triggering hardship and riots that culminated in the vicious civil war. So the refugee crisis that we have right now in Europe is really, in many respects, a climate change generated issue. I just returned last week from two week visit to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is ground zero for climate change, one of the most vulnerable countries in the world. The Bangladesh Prime Minister just wrote this, quote, each year the impact of climate change wipes out two to three percent of the country's gross domestic product and some 900,000 Bangladeshis have died over the past 35 years because of severe storms and natural disasters attributable to global warming. And by 2050, it's predicted that a one to three foot rise in sea levels caused by global warming will submerge 17 percent of the country's land mass and affect 35 million people. Well, that's as many as everybody in Canada in that, in that zone. The human cost of global warming has a name, climate injustice. The remedy is climate justice. What's that? Climate justice involves recognizing that the victims of global warming are not responsible for it, nor can their actions alone halt it. So we have to take some effective action, and that must be by those who are really the most responsible, the developed countries and corporations that have spewed the most CO2 into our atmosphere. We must take the lead and show the greatest ambition in our respective countries and show support for vulnerable communities. And action is needed today on three fronts. We have to try and rein in carbon emissions, that is, mitigate them. We have to uh, try and put in measures to adapt to climate change that's already happening, that we can't stop to some extent. And finally, there's going to be loss and damage that we can't deal with. You can only mitigate emissions to some extent, you can only adapt to it to some extent, but there's kinds of losses and damage you can't prevent. What's that? Well, best example is when islands and countries are going to disappear, like the shoreline of Bangladesh, or in the Maldive Islands. I, I, I have the opportunity to, to appear with Mo, Mohammed Nasheed, the former president of the Maldive Islands. And by the way, there's a film that's called The Island President. If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. Go and watch that film. It's a wonderful film. Anyway, he spoke when we unveiled this climate report that I was involved with, and he said, you know, the Maldives will probably not be around in our lifetime. And if that happens, what happens to our country? What happens to our nationality? What happens to our language? What happens to our culture? The Maldives have been there in the middle of the Indian Ocean for the last 10,000 years, and we have a written history that goes back 2,000. Now exactly, would that history go with us? Would everything to do with us go with us? Or where would it go? Now, that means, brings me back to uh, uh, this topic of the carbon budget. You've already heard about the two degree C target. Well, scientists have calculated and we have to understand that we're in a crisis. We're, as, as Dominique said, we're now headed without any effective action to a climate chaos, three to four degree warming in temperature. How do we avoid that? We can only avoid it if we keep uh, the temperature to two or even to 1.5. How do we get that? We have to be cognizant of a carbon budget that is limit the total cumulative carbon or greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. And it's important to understand that carbon emissions to the atmosphere do not go magically away once they're up in the sky. 
they don't dissipate or transform. Rather, once released, they are part of the cumulative total. They stick around for a couple hundred years. So, to keep to a two degree C increase, scientists calculate we must cap emissions below one trillion tonnes of carbon in the atmosphere. If we want to keep it to a 1.5 degree C increase, we must cap emissions to 600 billion tonnes. Where are we now? Well, as of June 2014, we were already at 580 billion tonnes, and at current rates back in 2014, it was calculated that the trillionth ton would be emitted in December 2040. Now let's see where we're at just at this point in time. This is a clock that's running as we speak, and it shows instead of where we were at in the previous slide of 580 billion, we're now up to 598 billion, 425 trillion, you know, whatever, you can count, and it's growing. And it also indicates that, uh, well, in just 20 months, we've, we've gained 18 billion tonnes more of CO2. We now also have two years less, only till 2038, only 22 years to go before we re reach one trillion tonnes. So we just can't wait. We need to start cutting back emissions. Great. So let's talk about COP21. Why it was such a big deal? So you might have heard about it in the news. A lot of the uh, world leaders around the world have been talking about this for a while. So in, in December, there were actually 150 world leaders that were at COP and 40,000 attendees from government, youth, business, academic, and civil society organizations. Again, this was the most important COP because it was the first time that 195 countries committed to a globally binding climate agreement. Why that's important? Well, actually, it also was the first time that uh, the aspirational 1.5 degree targets, we talked about that a little bit at the beginning, was included in the legally binding agreement. So, in theory, countries will work towards trying to achieve the 1.5 degree target. It was also the COP where we saw Justin Trudeau, our Prime Minister, say that Canada was back. So after 10 years of uh, different climate policies, the new Trudeau administration has a lot of different strategies that they were very keen to share at COP21 and very excited. There's also a lot of commitments from the big polluters that traditionally or typically before weren't um, committing that much. So the US, China and India were big players in uh, ramping up the ambition for this agreement. Another thing to note, this agreement actually sets a five-year review of the national plans. Of uh, Each country has a national plan uh, of reduce, reducing their emissions, and some included adaptation plans to that too. So there's a five-year review that's anchored in this agreement. This agreement also recognizes loss and damage. So David spoke a little bit about this. But why it's important that's in the legally binding text is that it recognizes that there will be permanent climate impacts, climate change impacts. So to small island states or to Bangladesh and the shoreline mentioned. It's also really important to note that there are major investments in clean technology, um, both at COP and before COP. Um, and Canada, for example, has pledged $300 million a year for research and development on clean energy technology. That really sets forward the clean energy economy and sets really, really positive trends. Another big thing, so basically COP21 had a bunch of different announcements, very positive. Um, another one of those was the Fossil Fuel Subsidy Reform Coalition. It's a coalition that Canada is part of, also about 35 to 40 countries, along with business and NGOs, uh, basically committing to reform fossil fuel subsidies and trying to redirect that money into renewable energy. And if I could direct your attention to the, the quote on the screen from the Indian Environment Minister, I like it because it really reflects the political sort of statements of COP. So we have opened a new chapter of hope in the lives of 7 billion people on the planet. We have today reassured these future generations that we will all together give them a better earth. So a lot of the politicians after COP21 were like, yes, we have an agreement. This is very, very exciting. But take that with a grain of salt. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes about the agreement. So for what it could have been, it's a miracle. And for what it should have been, it's a disaster. So, of course, it was a very important political achievement. 195 countries, like I said, came together for the first time. Um, but a lot of people say that it's not where we need to go. And David... I was going to touch on that, especially in the context of human rights. Just have a little bit of uh, the pictures uh, included there. So these conferences that happen every year, um, of course, it's a political event. There's negotiators, politicians, and that's a very important component. But there are a lot of other actors, so young youth actors, NGOs, civil society, who are there and who make a point to, to raise their voice. 
So that's just a picture of a peaceful demonstration that happened in the streets of Paris, uh, and that typically happened with these cops. Okay, so uh, you've heard some very positive things about the Paris Agreement. Uh, it does contain tremendous aspirations, but it lacks legal requirements to ensure the perspiration required for us to get where we need to be. In my view, there are some worrisome practical and legal gaps in it. Let me tell you about those. First, the Paris Agreement lacks specific measures and enforceable means to limit emissions from existing greenhouse gases. So even though uh, the world leaders set good goals in terms of keeping below 2 degrees C and preferably to 1.5, there's nothing in the agreement requiring individual countries or even groups of countries to uh, reduce emissions by specific amounts or by a particular deadline. Countries committed only to a peaking of emissions, quote, as soon as possible, unquote, with recognition it would take longer for developing countries and a goal to get in the second half of the century to what they call net greenhouse gas neutrality, meaning in effect no more coming out from uh, human or man-made sources than what can be absorbed by oceans and, and uh, vegetation. Second, there's no real restriction on the business as usual approach for carbon producers. Although at least one commentator suggested the biggest loser in the Paris Agreement could be the fossil fuel industry, in fact, the Paris Agreement doesn't really threaten them. Their interests are well protected. The words oil and carbon, uh, oil and, and, and things like that are not even mentioned in the, in the agreement, fossil fuel. Third, the agreement fails to mention or even endorse the need to keep significant amounts of carbon in the ground. This carbon budget that I talked about earlier not only requires emissions to not be beyond a certain level, it, it also is dependent on what we're now calling embedded carbon reserves remaining in the ground, like big oil and gas companies and carbon uh, and, and coal companies have reserves. The uh, International Edu Energy Agency has uh, calculated that to keep the global temperature rise to less than 2 degrees C, at least 66% and as much as 80% of those embedded carbon reserves must remain in the ground. And in a similar vein, goals advocated by some countries such as decarbonization and climate neutrality never made it into the final text. And the fourth point is that the agreement is disappointing for failing to provide any language with respect to human rights in the operating parts of the agreement. Finally, human rights is mentioned in the preamble, but it didn't get much further than that, and, and that is disappointing after all the efforts put into it. So when, after I pointed out some of the what I think are worrisome elements. Uh, the question is, is there a backup plan? Where does this leave us? Well, I think frustrated citizens may increasing, or worried citizens may increasingly need to take political steps as well as call on domestic court judges to remind their governments that they must substantially rein in carbon emissions and not just spout greenhouse gas rhetoric. And we're going to talk more about that. So the next thing I want to talk about is a little bit more about human rights in, in this context. Um, so that's the cover of a report that uh, I put out for the International Bar Association, where we looked at all the laws and mechanisms in the world that might interplay with climate change, and we tried to determine if they were well suited or not to helping abate climate emissions. And unfortunately, they're not. But we didn't stop there. We also made a number of recommendations. and. Uh, if anybody wants to learn more about this in any detail, it, it's a report that's reasonably easy to read, uh, and you can download it. Just go to IBA Climate Justice Report, International Bar Association Climate Justice Report. Now, our report had been preceded by uh, some statements at the United Nations Human Rights Council, uh, and in that slide there's reference to uh, referencing climate change in 2011, uh, recognizing that it does have impacts on human rights. Let's go to the next slide where I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it. So UN human rights treaty bodies all recognize there is this intrinsic link between the environment and the realization of a range of human rights. So in 2009, the UN Human Rights Council passed a resolution that noted that climate change related impacts include the right to life, the right to adequate food, the right to the highest attainable standard of health, the right to adequate housing, the right to self-determination, safe drinking water and sanitation. It also, the UN Human Rights Council also recognized 
that these implications affect uh, people who are already vulnerable due to geography, poverty, gender, age, indigenous or minor minority status and disability. So that was in 2009. More recently, John Knox, who was appointed as a UN independent expert on human rights obligations relating to the environment, concluded that, quote, states have obligations to protect against environmental harm that interferes with enjoyment of human rights, unquote. Well, that sounds pretty good, except what we have to recognize is, unfortunately, international law doesn't have the ability by itself to require states to immediately act on that, quote, obligation. But fortunately, there is something in some of our laws that does require governments to act. And many countries around the world do have constitutions that speak to the right to life, and in some cases, the right to a healthy environment. As this slide shows, this right has also been incorporated into at least two regional human rights agreements. Now in Canada, we have a Charter of Rights. It does reference the right to life and to security of the person, but contains, our Charter contains no reference to the environment. However, there are decisions of Supreme Courts in several countries which have interpreted the right to life as necessarily including the right to a healthy environment. Why? Well, obviously because really there can't be any human rights, including the right to life, without a healthy environment. So it's not a big stretch, but no one's ever tried it yet in Canada. As I keep hinting, students like you and as you grow up, and even now, uh, as students and citizens have a role to play in asserting these rights before our domestic courts and before human rights commissions, and some of this is going on in the world. So what if human rights are not respected? Well, there can be, in some cases, cases taken to a few tribunals. Like in Europe, there's a European Court of Human Rights, which found that environmental degradation may have violated the right to life and have said certain countries had to do something about those situations. But most usually, human rights complaints are put before national or regional human rights commissions, if they exist. And in Canada, while well, we have a Canadian human rights commission and we have human rights commissions in each province, they don't even talk about anything like this. They talk about discrimination by reason of age or religion. They don't recognize human rights implications of climate change. We've got to change that. But even if you have a human rights commission, they often don't have the ability to make legal findings. They can make findings, they can make recommendations, but they don't often have the legal ability to make binding orders to governments. Dom, it's over to you. So what about the rights that aren't respected that don't make it to court? So at COP21 is really interesting because it was one of the first times that a lot of these uh, discussions were be, being had at um, a relatively high level. So by 2050, Scary to think about it. There are, there's anywhere between 500 million to 1 billion people projected to be displaced. Um, a lot of the small island states, like the Seychelles, like Kiribati, which is a, uh, a country in the Pacific Ocean, are now considering what the next steps are if they need to um, move their population over because of rising sea levels. So Kiribati, for example, has already bought land in Fiji to relocate its 100,000 population as global warming impacts accelerate. So what's interesting about Kiribati is they have this concept of migrating with dignity. So they focus on education and vocational training in order to provide their people with the skills and opportunities to migrate and work abroad. It's a scary thought, but migration, as, per, as the president of Kiribati said, I think earlier this week, is set to begin as early as 2020. So Kiribati, um, it's not the only country that's facing these issues. A lot of small island states like Tuvalu, the Marshall Islands, Papua New Guinea, who are facing extremely difficult times, can't grow uh, food crops, salt water seeping through uh, the land and making it impossible for them to continue living there. There's a quote from one of the, the people who are moving in Kiribati. It says, for many, moving to another location is basically leaving their livelihoods and leaving their values and cultures behind. Imagine being forced and being told that you can't live in your home anymore. So if we take a step back and try to think what this all means for Canada. So COP21, like I mentioned, was important because Canada is back. Justin, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau campaigned on the promise of real change. And 
we question whether or not the political shift is upon us. So in, at COP21, Canada played a very ambitious role. They joined the High Ambition Coalition in calling for uh, more ambitious action in the agreement. They pledged $2.7 billion to fight climate change in developing countries. And it's also reassuring to see that a lot of different provinces in Canada now are are now have carbon pricing schemes. So Alberta announced earlier this year carbon tax. Ontario is rolling out their cap and trade system. BC has had a cap, carbon carbon tax for a while now. So it just raises the question of whether or not fossil fuels are near their end. So one thing that's really exciting on the Canadian front is the Pan-Canadian Climate Change Framework. So this is Prime Minister Trudeau's plan to work with provinces and territories to create a plan uh, to achieve their ambition, their ambition and emission reductions. So they're having a first minister's meeting actually next week or the week after in Vancouver, where they're going to be setting out the, the plans for this framework. So basically the impacts of climate change can no longer, no longer be ignored and they're already being felt in Canada. So loss and damage, like we discussed, is actually already happened in our Canadian Arctic. For example, in Pangantung, Nunavut, uh, in a, a couple years ago, the two bridges connecting the small community could no longer be used because permafrost was melting. So those are the two bridges that connect them to their freshwater, to their waste management, <clears throat> uh, to other basic services that couldn't be used for two weeks because of the melting permafrost. So this is a trend that we're seeing across the Arctic and affecting our fellow Canadians. We're also seeing, and as you probably know, the increasing concern of sea level rise in BC. So there's increased risk of erosion and flooding, risk of coastal infrastructure, um, risk increased maintenance and repair costs, loss of property, just to name a few of the potential issues. All right, so how do we achieve the carbon budget? How do we reframe for action? Who's responsible for getting action? Well, who's responsible for solving these problems and solving the climate crisis? My answer would be, we all are, but, only those like you and me who know there is a crisis on the scientific basis, the carbon, carbon budget issue, are really equipped to begin to help solve it. We must, you must spread that information. It's amazing that so many in our society, I've talked to other judges and lawyers, they, did, they knew something about climate change, they thought, of, yeah, it was an issue, but they, no one really understood that it's such a critically time-limited issue in which we have to act, and we have an opportunity and an obligation to do it. We can get action by various means. Some of these are on the slide. Governments, for example, can regulate carbon, carbon restrict it. They can phase out fossil fuel subsidies and put them into green energy. We need political leadership. We need funding to implement renewable energy. We need legal reforms, and we need citizen action. And you, my friends in BC that I'm looking at now, are citizens and it's uh, many of you can take action and uh, another thing that will happen is that we we need to help drive the view that carbon is going to become should be regarded as a toxic substance after all it's the carbon in a, that's up there and that's continuing to go up there that's going to impair all these human rights and you know why should it not in that context be regarded as a toxic substance and in fact carbon reserves will be, and I think that's going to be driven by the insurance industry and the financial industry who are going to say, we're not going to put our money into investments that could be killing people and, and disrupting hundreds of millions of people and drowning oceans, drowning people in oceans. So carbon should and is likely going to be regarded as a toxic substance. We need to get off the carbon, the toxic carbon diet, and it can happen. Look at the ads and how we regarded tobacco well before you were born. The ad was, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. The health profession endorsed smoking. Well, we know it's a little bit different today. Attitudes can and must change with regard to carbon, just like they did with tobacco. And look at this ad on the left for Texaco gasoline, the best friend your car ever had. Well, advertising for more sales of gas are likely to in future be replaced by warning labels on gas pumps like the one on the right, warning use of this fuel product contributes to climate change, which may put up to 30% of species at a likely risk of extinction. So it's citizen action that would drive this kind of thing. And in BC, I believe it's already started to get municipalities in BC to endorse putting these labels on gas pump handles. 
I spoke about the financial community. Mark Carney, he's the former governor of the Bank of Canada. He's currently the governor of the Bank of England. He gave a speech in England a few months ago. This is a headline from the Huffington Post. Climate change threatens financial system. Oil could be stranded assets. In other words, he's saying, you know, let's look at the assets of British Petroleum and Shell Oil, two of the largest oil companies in the world. Do they really have the assets that they claim on their books? Or will it be the case because carbon is going to be uh, regarded as a toxic substance that they're only going to be allowed to take out some of them. They're going to have stranded assets. So it's this kind of thing that I think is going to drive us. Uh, and we need to be uh, thinking about that. Uh, the carbon majors. Well, this is something, a term you might not have heard of, but here's a study done in 2013. 63% of the carbon dioxide and methane up in the atmosphere in the last 150 years since the Industrial Revolution can be attributed to 90 existing emitters. These are corporations and state-owned companies. Some of them are still around. Some of them are names you would know, like Exxon and Chevron and BP. Well, and, and so, you know what? They put up 63% uh, of that CO2 that's up there now, but they have not been paying anything towards abating the cost of climate change that's already begun. So that brings us to what citizens, frustrated citizens, have been doing quite successfully beginning this year. And I want to tell you very briefly about three, four cases. Uh, I've listed four of them. Uh, I'll start with one from Pakistan. This happened in October. This is a case where a farmer went to the high court of Pakistan and said, uh, Judge, uh, the government of Pakistan has adopted a plan to help us adapt to climate change. Uh, they should be building things to protect us from flooding, but they're not doing anything. And the judge summoned uh, all 25 deputy ministers from various government departments in his courtroom and said, gentlemen I, and ladies, I understand the allegation is you're not doing anything. Tell me about it. So after a day of hearing, the uh, judge said, so I think I'm hearing that, in fact, the complainant is right. You're not doing very much. And one of the ministers said, yes, Your Honor, that's right, we're not. And so the judge said, well, that's not good enough. I'm ordering you to come back in two weeks and tell me three specific concrete things that the government of Pakistan is going to do before the end of last year. And also, I'm ordering a judicial commission to supervise the government, and they're going to report to me on what they're doing and, and to make sure that you're doing things. And, of course, a court order can mean to people uh, that if they don't obey it, they're in contempt of court. They could even go to jail. Why did the judge feel that way? Well, he said, and I'll give you a couple of quotes. He said, climate change is a defining challenge of our time. On a legal and constitutional plane, this is a clarion call for the protection of fundamental rights of the citizens of Pakistan in particular, the vulnerable and weak segments of the society who are unable to approach this court. Fundamental rights, like the right to life, which includes the right to a healthy and clean environment, and the right to human dignity, read with constitutional principles of democracy, equality, social, economic, and political justice, include commitments that would require this court to order the government to basically act and protect people. And um, so that was a very important uh, decision. Another decision was one from Holland. In fact, the one earlier this year, last year in September, the Urgenda case resulted in a citizens group, took the government of Holland to court and got the court to order the government to reduce carbon emissions 20, by 25% by 2020. And the court found that the national government had a duty of care to its citizens requiring the state to reduce emissions. And, you know, so that... That's a very important concept because it helps us understand that judges can now engage in this topic. They can now hold, they can, courts, our domestic courts, whether it's in Holland or India or Pakistan or Canada, can be an action forcing mechanism that can help achieve what 20 years of UNFCC negotiations have not, that is actual reductions in carbon emissions. And that's to be contrasted, unfortunately, with international law which doesn't really provide legally enforceable remedies at this point in time. So based on the Urgenda approach, citizens in various other countries could ask their domestic courts to determine their governments owe them a duty of care, whether it's a constitutional duty of care, whether it's a common law tort duty of care, or a human rights obligation requiring their government to protect citizens. And why, why are the judges now able to engage in this? Well, I'd say there's two major factors. One is that the climate change science is now clear. The IPCC International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has made it pretty clear. We've given you some of those facts about the carbon budget. We have a limited time to act if we want to keep the world from climate chaos. Secondly, uh, there's clear evidence that 
various parties to the United Nations Framework Convention and their governments know these dangers, yet most states are failing to act in accordance with this knowledge. So I think judges hearing this kind of a complaint by citizens will be kind of fed up and basically saying to the governments, look, you know it's a problem, you said it's dangerous, you said you would do something about it at an international level. Citizens have rights, shouldn't we ask, shouldn't we order you to do something? And I think uh, some judges will actually do that, as we saw in Holland. The other interesting thing is about the Dutch case is the government argued that, well, you know, judge, even if there's a duty of, of care on us, you know, Holland only puts out 0.5% of the world's carbon emissions. So why would you order us to cut back? It doesn't deserve legal redress. Well, the court rejected that argument, and here's what it said. It's an established fact that climate change is a global problem and therefore requires global accountability. The fact that the amount of the Dutch emissions is small compared to other countries does not affect the obligation to take precautionary measures in view of the state's obligation to exercise care. Emission reduction concerns both the joint and individual responsibility of the signatories to the UN Climate Change Convention. So the court was clear to say every country's got to do something. The last case I want to mention very briefly is one that's called Our Children's Trust out of Washington State, where uh, a number of uh, people in high school actually became plaintiffs in the case, sued the Washington State government, said the state government is not doing enough to reduce climate emissions, and the court agreed with them and said that the government had a duty to protect the public interest and made sure and was very concerned to make sure that the Washington State government acted effectively. The last case I simply want to mention is one that hasn't been decided yet. Citizens in the Philippines, where there's been two devastating cyclones during the cops of the last few years, mm -hmm. uh, have gone to court, to not, have gone to their Human Rights Commission with the help of Greenpeace, trying to get a, a finding that these carbon majors, the big oil companies that I mentioned before, have some obligation to help out these climate victims. We'll see what happens there. That's, that's pending. So, our last slide, what's ahead? What's ahead? So, COP21 was a big, big political achievement, um, and really it's up to us, citizens and young people, to make sure and hold our governments accountable. I want to quickly note that citizen and student groups play a huge role in um, civil society action on climate change. So, even at COP21, a lot of youth NGOs play a, a very big influence on negotiators and they're very, very active in that realm. Even student organizations, both in university, like I'm part of, or even groups in high school. There are a lot of things you can do to raise awareness and strategize to take action. I wanna highlight also the, the role of institutions, so of public institutions like universities in divestment campaigns. I'm not sure if you've seen headlines about divestment, but so far there's been over $3.4 trillion divested away from fossil fuels into more renewable energy funds. So that's taking public funds and putting them towards renewable energy. And uh, the, the example of the gas pump labeling that we saw earlier today, that's an example of citizen action. That is um, an organization that was built with the idea of one person to, to raise awareness in, in that context. So it just highlights the power of everyone to, ra to raise their voice and to take action. Right, well, I just want to say, you know, repeat that I think that you have various ways in which you can act, and, and Dom's talked about them, I've talked about them, the court cases I mentioned illustrate them. You know, the one in Washington, as I said, was by high school students. So there's a lot of things that need to be done and, and Really, and we're so happy that we had an opportunity to speak with you. Now's the time to make your voice heard. Time is of the essence. Mm -hmm. And uh, we want to stop there, perhaps, and turn it over to you. We're happy to answer any questions you have. It should be on. Yeah. yeah. My name is Elisa and this is Alexandra. We will be facilitating the question and answer session. Please listen carefully for the process to follow. We have 10 minutes for questions. Please remain seated until question period is over. Everyone will be dismissed together. Does anyone have questions? So you should say your name and then 
for your questions. Um, hello, my name is Isabella, and my question to both of you is, do you recall a certain moment in um, your childhood or in your, your lifetime where the passion for climate change and human rights really um, formed inside you, and that's when your passion, when you truly re realized your passion? It's a great question. Uh, for me, it was in high school, actually. So I had gone on a trip to uh, to Niger um, with a, with some family, and that was the first time that I saw poverty. Really, I hadn't in, in the development context, and I came back and I wanted to be a doctor, and uh, quickly realized that for me that wasn't really the, the best option. For me, as, as I was reading about environmental issues, I was reading about human rights issues, and how that tied into poverty and other development contexts. Um, I thought that environment and climate change was really the, the path for me. So in high school, I ended up joining my environment committee, um, and I started organizing campaigns in high school. And then after high school, I wanted to continue that further. So I looked at different universities that had uh, environmentally focused programs that would allow for inter interdisciplinary studies. Um, and that's why I chose Waterloo, because it has a co-op program. So it was just a perfect fit for me. So that was my moment. No, uh, David. no, that's a great uh, explanation. Uh, I, right from the beginning of uh, my practice of law, believed that uh, law could help uh, get better environmental quality. But even though I practiced environmental law for 40 years, it wasn't until about four years ago that I became aware of the, the, the nature of climate change was not just some general issue that I knew existed and believed existed, but that it was of the crisis nature that we illustrated in our slides. When I saw the time-limited the problem that we have, uh, and the, I thought, my goodness, we really have to act on it. So that's why I've been so, so uh, predominant in trying to articulate that this is a problem that we have to act on. If we can't get action on it, we've got to use all the means at our disposal, political, legal, and whatever. And, and so it was only with that realization of the criticalness that I, I became engaged on the specific climate change. Hi, my name is Alyssa. Um, my question is, how is the Canadian government going to enforce carbon reductions on, like, oil companies and How are they going to achieve emission reductions? And what they're going to do with oil companies. In particular with oil companies. How is the Canadian government going to enforce, um, how is the Canadian government going to enforce uh, reductions on carbon. Enforce reduction. Yeah. Well, the Canadian government has, and, and provincial governments have the complete legal ability to stop any levels of emissions they want. If they can legislate them. They can they can require them to be lowered. They can they can make it illegal. Now, there's obviously economic issues involved in all of that, and so that's why the government needs to uh, be uh, and will be, you know, as sensitive to that. Uh, often in our society. Oil interests have come to predominate in the public debate about these things. When you read the newspapers, you often see that the oil, you know, the, the price of oil is low, and therefore the Canadian economy is low, and seem to be, you know, uh, 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 the notion that if we act harshly towards uh, carbon production and oil companies, that, that will only be bad for the Canadian economy. When when you get more neutral people looking at these things, we know that we can produce a green economy that will produce lots of jobs. We can transform our economy if we put, took the, the, oil, the subsidies and tax breaks away from the oil industry that they have and put them into green energy, we could have very productive uh, uh, employment. Of course, there will be people working in the oil industries that will be disrupted, and, and I'm sure some of us have families that are in that industry. But you know what? We all, we want, 150 years ago, we had slavery in Canada, in the United States, and in, in England, and it didn't get abolished easily either. And people felt that their plantations were going to be disrupted. But, you know, we, we changed what we knew had to be done. So we'll have to do it here. And if I can just add quickly, too. It's a really good question. And it's one question that a lot of youth groups and civil society groups have asked the government, especially at COP and uh, in other meetings afterwards. And um, when and I was part of some youth organizations at COP, and when we asked that question, the government told us that they would consider this sort of issue 
and incorporate it in what they're calling the Pan-Canadian Climate Change Framework. So that's the one I was mentioning that they're meeting, the ministers are meeting next week to put together. So that's one thing um, that we can keep pressure on and keep our governments accountable um, and really keep an eye on to, to see what that Canadian plan is really going to look like. And also, do you think the government will um, put in these ways for them to stop carbon emissions? Do like, you think there's a chance that they will put in these measures? For, personally, I think that I'm, I'm more hopeful with this government that there will be real and more ambitious measures. Um, again, it comes back down to really making sure that we keep our governments accountable. So that means on, in, on social media, in meetings, um, once you're old enough to vote, to vote. Um, and so personally, I, I'm, I'm a little in the middle, so I'm, I'm hopeful, um, but it, it's definitely a tough road ahead to see if we'll actually achieve our emissions. Um, hi, uh, I'm Zainab. Uh, so I had a question about the technology and the clean energy, as you stated. So there are a lot of like companies and initiatives that are working on this uh, you know, clean energy and technologies. So I wanted to know to what extent do these clean energies and technologies help uh, to reduce carbon emission and you know, affect climate change? Well, that's, that's a, a good question. I mean, there are certainly technologies out there that can work at this, but I mean, one of the big things that got promoted in the last couple of years was so-called carbon sequestration. You know, the, the, the big petrochemical companies said, well, we can, we can capture the CO2 as it's coming out and, uh, and uh, sort of put it in the ground and keep it there. That's been proven to be quite horrendously expensive and one has to wonder how long they can actually keep it there before it actually gets back up by itself because it wants to get up. Um, I, the, the real technological uh, uh, challenge is to, to make sure that we can produce green energy in, in better ways. We shouldn't be having so many fossil fuel cars on the road. If, we're, if we accept that we're going to continue to have a lot of transportation that's not mass transportation, we should have a lot of mass transportation, but as long as there's going to be private vehicles, we've got to get them converted to electricity. We've got to do more. You know what? If we actually thought of this as a crisis that was like a war, we'd be able to do all this very fast because the technology. there are people out there with good ideas. They just need more money and more uh, rewards for getting it done. And once we do that, we can achieve it. There are laws and tax incentives that need to be brought in that would help encourage green technology and I think the Canadian government is aware that they have a challenge there and I think they want to do that. Mm -hmm. And what's hopeful with this with this money that I was mentioning before, so 300 million a year, so they're going to be focusing on renewable energy and other sort of startups. In, in British Columbia is actually a leader in Canada um, in fostering that sort of innovation. I think Vancouver has something, I can correct me if I'm wrong, something like the most startups clean energy startups per capita than anywhere else in Canada, which is really, really great. And this money, again, this is very preliminary. They just announced it, announced it a couple months ago, but it could mean that more money is injected in those uh, hubs of, of clean energy to try to promote more innovation and more products coming out of that. A little, uh, one more, a little question. So, as a student, what can we do to impact, to have a positive impact on climate change? It's a great question. Just jump quickly on that. There's, a, there's so many different things you can do, um, and it's very empowering as a young person because there are a lot of opportunities for you to learn more about these issues and uh, to take action. So you can think locally, you can think in your communities, you can have conversations with your peers, with your parents, with your family members about how climate change is going to impact your community and how it's impacting the world already. You can look at different local NGOs or different organizations. You may even see if your high school um, has a, a, an environment committee, because that's always a good way to think about these issues and think about how uh, your voice can be heard the most. Uh, for me, in high school and in university, I found there's, there's also these national sort of leader sustainability kind of programs. There's one, um, I think it needs to be in university, but you might, there, I think there might be some high school programs. It's called the Impact National Sustainability Leadership. So it's just um, 
a program that brings together young people from all over Canada to talk about these issues and to equip them with the tools to act on them. So keeping an eye out for those sort of opportunities and seeing you know, what's available to you to be able to um, experience and, and get the skills and the tools. Thank you. Let's have two really quick questions more and then we're Hi again. Um, I was just wondering, so I heard that electric cars kind of cause as much pollution as normal cars because of the way that they get energy. I was wondering if that was true and if there's other ways that we can like, get around other than cars because it causes as much pollution. Well, I'll take a stab at that. I mean, uh, first of all, mass transportation is, you know, obviously many times more efficient than any individual vehicle, even if it's electric. So we need to invest more in, in public transit and rapid transit and, and all. It's just a criminal event that we have so much trucking going on in Canada, for example, all through, you know, what happened to the railways that we used to have? And if all, a lot of that stuff moved on rail, we'd be saving a lot of uh, emissions right there. Electric vehicles, well, you, the thing is this, if, if um, the, um, the, if you can generate storage capacity during the daytime, uh, if, if when you're producing electricity, you can recharge at night. So it's really a question of, of solar and wind power having a storage capacity. People are working on that. Flywheels, uh, pumping up water during the day and letting it release at night, which then could charge the cars at night. These are things that are being worked on, and it doesn't necessarily have to depend on the on fossil fuel grids if, if we get that in place. Um, I'm Janine, and I was wondering what you both did at Paris um, at the International Climate Summit. What we did? Can you can you repeat that? I was wondering what you did at the International Climate Summit at Paris, in Paris. Okay, you, you go ahead. We, we both had different roles. Um, so for me, I kind of had a bunch of different hats. I was there with the University of Waterloo, so I was helping that delegation. Um, I also work with an NGO called the Youth Arctic Coalition, so it's basically um, about youth policy and youth decision making. Um, but overall, my role was with the Seychelles negotiating team, so it's a small island country. Uh, so I was just helping with research um, and basically helping as much as possible. So these negotiating teams are very, very small. They have four negotiators, I with myself. And if you compare that to Canada, for example, they have 50 negotiators. So it's a huge, huge capacity difference. So they're always looking for help in that kind of regard. So that's what, that was my role. I assisted that delegation. And then so David. Dominique's being very modest. I mean, I, I can't believe the kinds of things she was doing in Paris and, and, and the fact that she got to be a... A negotiator for an island state is, is pretty impressive aside from all the other things she, she was doing to help promote awareness. Uh, I was there uh, as an observer as, as on behalf of CG to pay attention to the debate about loss and damage and whether or not that was actually going to be recognized as something important that developed countries would deal with and actually agree to help out developing countries with after Paris. Unfortunately, Paris Agreement did recognize that loss and damage is something that developed countries have to help with. But uh, I was there as an observer. I wasn't there as an actual negotiator. There's there's thousands of people that come there. They can help educate people. They help uh, motivate people. They help uh, do many things. And, and if you want to get there, Dominique, you got there on your own. You paid your own way. Yeah. So in the end, the university funded us. But two years ago, I also attended COP19, also with the university. Um, and there's a lot of other young people who attend either with an NGO or they, they get an affiliation with an, with an organization and they end up paying their own way and it's incredibly worth it. Again, there's people from all over sectors, government, business, all, all over the place. It's a really, really um, interesting experience. Now, now we would like to invite Daniel Lerner to talk about the same Mr. Ashton, Mr. Yee, my name is Daniel. Thank you very much for generously offering the time to help the secondary students today. You have provided us with valuable insights into your national and international work in the area of climate change and human rights. You have helped to open our eyes to the real world and helped us realize what problems are out there and how to solve them. What really stood out during the presentation for me was that the people affected by climate change aren't the ones who are causing it, 
and they aren't the ones who can solve it either. On behalf of all the students here today, we would like to thank you. Everyone, please join us in applause for Mr. Estrin and Ms. Reed.